Donald Trump uses fear to both inspire and intimidate. Dr. Justin Frank explores Trump's use of fear. Check this out, leave your comments, ding the bell, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our channel. So, Dr. Frank, what is the impact on society when we have a leader who is so badly psychologically wounded or as badly psychologically wounded as Donald Trump? Well, the biggest problem is that we all, us Americans, let's say, in society, at one level or another, we mirror our president a little bit. Whether no matter if it's somebody we like or don't like, um, but when, so people, I, I still remember watching George Bush, and then a little bit later, watching on interviews with Condoleezza Rice on TV, and her speech pattern, her cadence of talk, had suddenly shifted from the way it used to be into sounding just like George Bush, uh, very similar pauses and similar. Uh, behavior. So we do imitate our presidents, all of us in one way or another. People start having uh, their hair cut like a president or acting certain ways. Uh, and I think that's always been the case. But when you have a psychological damp psychologically damaged president, the way Trump is seriously damaged, um, they inflict, they evacuate the damaged parts of their personality into us and then try to make it better. So, for example, one of the things that Trump did in his first, in his first, hopefully his only, uh, inauguration speech was he talked about the crisis in the American city and how terrible things are and what a, how violent things are. And then he talked about the crisis in industry that we've all these plants are closed. So he's talking about his own damage as a child unconsciously, but that he is now going to rescue us. So we end up feeling ourselves more damaged than we might be. And then he's going to make it all better. He's like the father who comes into the room and scares the hell out of their kids at uh, uh, with a terrible ghost story and then leaves. And then they scream and have nightmares. And he comes back in. And he says, I'm going to save you. I'll turn on the lights and everything's going to be OK. I mean, he's that kind of person. So he evacuates. To he pushes in his own anxiety into us. And people become anxious. I've never seen so many anxiety, examples of anxiety in my practice or from other people as right before this election. I, the people on both yeah. sides, right, wing and left, oh, everybody yeah. was freaking yeah. out. And that, yeah. a lot of that. To what extent do you, to to what extent do you think in that uh, inaugural, and we we have a little less than a minute before we're going to bounce into another break. Um, to to what extent do you think that what he, the subtext of that when he was talking about the cities was, there are black people in these cities, white people. I'm talking to you. I'm going to save you from them. Yes, I think that that a large part of it is the the whistle of racism, and. Uh, that he does talk to white people and says, and there really are the them and the us, and that's what he counted on. And in his rallies, there it's almost all white people, and uh, he pays, I guess, for a few black people to come. So he was speaking uh, about, uh, he was inviting part of his damage, that, this is really a great thing you asked, part of his damage is that he splits the world into good and evil, good and bad, and there's no nothing in between. There's no complexity. Um, how uh, Donald Trump in his uh, inaugural address was talking about, you know, the American carnage and specifically pointing to our cities. And, uh, you know, I will save you from this. And I asked you if if that is a uh, if if the real subtext, if the real message that Trump was trying to convey in that inaugural address was, white people across America, there's a lot of black people in the cities, and I'm going to save you from them. I'm going to protect you from them. Um, how does that dynamic play out, and how is that impacting our society, uh, if that analysis is, is accurate? Well, part of that is that he knows how to instill fear, because he's a person who has been frightened as a child and terribly frightened of his father. He had to deal with his father, who was a tyrant at home. So part of his individual psychology is to externalize fear. 
his own. So he has a place to put his fear, which is fear that white people have of black people. Now, what does he do to the black people? He also makes them afraid. They're afraid of him. They're afraid of the police. He gets both sides of a split to be afraid, it seems to me. And that's his way of externalizing. I mean, he's an equal opportunity projector. He gets rid of mm. fear, of, either through his racism or he gets black people uh, and the brown people to be afraid uh, of him and of, uh, of the powers that be. And so they don't trust the government either. So he really uh, is amazing at doing that. Unconsciously, he was, and probably consciously, he was always afraid of his father, always afraid of him. And he writes about it sort of casually in some of his books, but basically he would never buy a building without asking his father first. And then when he finally did do something like that, once or twice he makes these parenthetical comments, I was afraid to tell my father that I did this. And uh, he could never really stand up to his father. So he has always gotten rid of fear, and he does that through bravado, through being like his father. When he talks about how dare you talk to a president like that, when he did that with a reporter a couple of weeks ago, he was directly mimicking the way his father talked to reporters when his father was a real estate agent and people were questioning him about his unethical practices. He essentially said the exact same thing with the same tone of, tone of voice and would mock people. Hmm. He's very much like his father. And I think that's one of the things that has happened in his divisiveness. But the other thing is that because he can speak to people who can't say some of their own hurts and rage and fears, he gives voice to them. And he gives voice to the voices, like I said on one of your other, when we were talking a few weeks ago or months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of his great strengths. But part of what he does is he also gives people permission to use his language, to say lock her up, to be really full of hate and rage. And he allows people to do it because he does it. Um, I've recently become very interested in um, myths. And not so much myths in the traditional Freudian sense, like Oedipus and those kind of things, but actually children's fairy tales. Because I think that lots of people have talked about the emperor's new clothes and Trump. People haven't talked that much about Humpty Dumpty, uh, because I worry that sometimes America is like our democracy is like Humpty Dumpty, and all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put Humpty together again. And that's one of the biggest fears that a lot of us have about the damage that Trump has already done to our confidence in democracy and our confidence in our government. Um, that started a long time before Trump. But the other myth I that kids say to protect themselves, and Trump is a self-protector, is that sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's the one childhood fantasy that I really disagree with, because names can be very destructive. Calling people names is hurtful, and repeating names is hurtful. And Trump understands that more than just about anybody. That's why he says the press is the enemy of the people over and over again, why he talks about fake news over and over again. So by the four years of his presidency, we won't believe the results of the election because we're being lied to. He gets people to disbelieve things. Now, he was lied to as a child, I think, and I did work about on this a lot in my book, that one of the origins of compulsive lying is that the child has felt lied to by their parents when their parents say they love him. I love you. Mm. But to some children, that is a lie because clearly their behavior was not loving. The father was violent and enraged. The mother was pretty terrible and sort of chronically depressed. And so they become liars. They turn yeah. passive into active. They turn their victimhood into something else and they make us feel the way he probably felt as a little boy. Lied to, we don't know what's true, we don't know what to believe.